Well, good morning, everybody. Sorry, sorry if I didn't get to see you on the way in. We we're scrambling with some uh, technical difficulties. So um, this doesn't have any technical difficulties, though, and so it's easy to do this part. So um, let me start by praying. Father, we we thank you for this time, and we ask, Father, that you would speak to us, that you would um, communicate your truths to us through your word, through your Holy Spirit, and that, um, that they would just rest heavy on us, Father, that we would understand how you see us, and that we would understand your love and your grace and what you have for us. I pray that this morning, Father, as, as we unwrap some truths that are tough, I pray, Father, that you would just give us the willingness to be convicted, to be drawn close into your embrace. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we just sang a song. This isn't in the slides or anything yet, but we just sang uh, basically Galatians chapter 4. Where Paul says, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. That's what, that's what, that, that's what the song just right? And, and it's an incredible song. It's a beautiful song. But I'm going to talk about us being slaves to God today. And it's tough because we don't fully grasp our relationship to God and how God sees his relationship with us. Like we, we like that song. I love that song. It's great and it's true, right? And yet I'm going to read stuff today that goes, well, it seems as though <laughs> that is not. He's, he's going to specifically call us slaves to God. Specifically. <laughs> so it's a little challenging, right? Because you're like, well, what am I then? Am I a son or am I a slave? What's the difference? Something that we need to think about. And, and we're going to use the term slavery quite a bit, and we have. And, and, and here's the tough part. And even Paul addresses this. It doesn't get, it's not the right word. We're limited by language. We are, right? Like we cannot communicate everything that, that God is, right? We, we, have, a, we have finite language. And we, we run out of words and adjectives to describe how good he is, right? And so in the same way as, as he describes us as slaves and then he describes us as sons, we've got to understand that those are, those are two pieces of the same relationship. It's the same. In some ways, we should see ourselves as slaves to God, slaves to righteousness is what he's going to say, and what you hopefully read this last week in the earlier ver, uh, verses in chapter 6. But on the other hand, what's the difference between a slave and a son? He, he said, he goes on, Paul goes on to say that you now know what I'm about. You know my purposes. You know what I'm doing. That's what makes you a son. Like, it's not just blind obedience. It's not just I do what I'm told to do because I have to do it. In fact, we're going to see Paul outline that very clearly, that there's a relationship that he's restored, that we just spent the first five chapters of Romans going through, going, going what did God do for us and in our relationship and reconciling us to himself, right? So, so that's, the, that's the foundation of what we've established or what Paul's established, what the Holy Spirit has established through the beginning of Romans, is that we are united to Christ, that he took our sins and he gave us his righteousness. We're reconciled. It's done. Past tense, we were justified, right? That's what we've talked about. We are in a just standing before the judge of all creation. That's it. It's past tense. And he goes, now what? What's the implications of that? And that's what we're going to continue to unpack. And so this is where he unpacks it. Well, how are you living? Are you living as a slave or a son? Or, or are you living in disobedience? You see, both slaves and sons obey. Should obey. Right? And so... But the difference between those is relationship. And so as we walk through this this morning, I don't want us to go in a, in a bad way of going down this path of going, slavery to God, that sounds miserable. 
No. No. And I'm not going to be able to unpack all of it this morning, but, but that's the path of peace and righteousness and justice and contentment and joy. And so I'm going to say this morning, we want to be slaves to God. I would even go so far as to argue you have two options in life. Two places where you can be slaves to. Slaves to God or not. That's it. There is no such thing as freedom in the sense that we think of freedom. I'm going to unpack that, okay? So let's, let's, let's dive in. Yeah, let's just roll right into it. All right, so especially in America, right? The founding fathers, all that. Self-determination. That was what they were about, right? Governmentally, right? Like, like we can, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? We can live whatever lives we want. This is an ideal, isn't it? We think about this, we're like, man, I would love to just like not pay taxes. I would just love to just be on my own, make my own decisions. That's what the world sees as freedom. And, and maybe you can make some arguments for that from a civil governmental perspective. But that's not biblical freedom. It's not what the Bible describes as freedom. And that's what Paul's going to unpack. We're going to be in Romans chapter 6, verse 20. It's going to take me a little bit, as normal, to get to verse 20. But we're going to be jumping around in chapter 6 a little bit. So if you have your Bibles, you can open those up. The verses will be on the screens as well. All right. So this week, you spent time walking through, hopefully, Romans chapter 6, verse 12, and through verses 19. And what we saw in verse 19, he says, I am speaking, sorry, yeah, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So he says there's the before, before this whole great exchange between Christ and us happened, before all of that, you were slaves to lawlessness and rebellion. And after, we're free. That's not what he says. We're slaves to righteousness now. You see, both, both before and after, we're slaves. We are, we are enslaved, and I'm going to break this down because I know this doesn't sit well, right? Like nobody's like, I don't want to hear this. I don't like this. And, and again, just hang with me because the words aren't good, okay? They aren't, they aren't, they aren't grasping what, what, what God is trying to communicate here. Like, like, again, it's finite language. I mean, look at what Paul says. I am speaking in human terms. Even Paul's like, listen, I'm stuck here, okay? I'm trying to express the weight of this relationship between us and God now, this new life, this post-resurrection life, right? This, this life that has made us free from sin. We're no longer enslaved to sin. This this new life, and it's like we're slaves to righteousness. That's what Paul is saying here. But look, go back to verse 16, Romans chapter 6, verse 16. He describes this. He says, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So there's two sides to this, right? There's obedience to God, and there's disobedience to God. That's it. There's two categories. Like, I... I I think culturally we think that there's like, okay, there's, there's God's stuff over here, there's like Satan's stuff over here, and I'm just going to be like one step on this side. And as long as I'm like, as long as I'm one step over, I'm, I'm good. And we, we, we try to navigate this middle way. And this is what Paul's saying. This is what God's saying here. That, that's not how that works. You are either obeying God, or you are obeying lawlessness. You are either 
following God or you are following after something else. And what's the something else? It's ourselves. It's, it's, it's satanic, right? It, it's, it's, it's rebellion in whatever sense of the matter, but, but it's, it's our own hearts, right? Like, you're either worshiping God or you're worshiping yourself. And, like, you know, you, you don't have to be a devil worshiper to not be obeying God, right? Like, th- those aren't the two options. I know we, we kind of like that because then we're like, oh, I'm not that, so clearly I'm good, right? He goes, no, 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 that's not the point, right? Like, when we are masters of our own destiny, when we're determining our lives based on ourselves and not God, that's disobedience, that's rebellion. When we do the things that our hearts want, that's where we're at. And look at what um, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The context here isn't just money. You you guys get what he's saying here? There's obedience and there's disobedience. That's it. Those are the options. There's there's obedience to God and there's obedience to ourselves. You cannot say that you are devoted to God and devoted to your own affairs, to the own desires of your heart. You cannot. Cannot. That's what he says. You can't have two masters. So who's your master? We say Jesus is Lord often. And that just rolls off of our tongues. Especially as people who, frankly, are free. But to say that Jesus is Lord is to say that he is master. He is ruler of our lives. He is re- you guys... He is grasping this, right? Like, this is not, and, we're, and let me break, we're still sons, right? We're still sons and daughters, and it's beautiful, and we've got this beautiful relationship. But in the midst of that, God goes, if you love me, obey me. If you love me, keep my commandments, right? This is what Jesus says. This is what we see throughout all of Scripture, and yet we push it to the side, and we just go, yeah, but hang tight over there, God. I'm going to do a little self-determination for a little bit. And, this is, and we see this as freedom. The world sees this as freedom. The world sees that like, if I'm following after my own heart, that's it. That's freedom. And what they don't grasp is that that's actually enslavement. And so it's a fake freedom. And, and Paul says this in Romans chapter 6, verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. I think Paul's like playing on this a little bit. Like I I think he wanted to put like an ellipsis after free. He's like, when you were slaves to sin, when you were doing whatever your heart's desire was, you were free. You were totally free from righteousness. (laughs) I think it's a I think he's really like going like you. You think it's free, but it's, but it's not freedom. It's fake freedom. And this is what the world thinks is freedom. And this is, frankly, this is what we often think is freedom, right? And so we need to be brought back into this going, no, no, what, what is real freedom? In Jeremiah 17, 9, right, I quote this all the time because this is the one that I, I think is a great verse to memorize. The heart is deceitful above all things. You can just, pretty much every day, you could probably tell yourself that, right? Because you go, well, what do I want to do? I don't know. What do I want to do today? 
What do I want to do in my life? What do I feel like? I don't know. But your heart can be deceitful. Your heart can tell you that something's good when it's not good. That's what deceit is. So when we are our master, right? When, when we are our own lords and masters of self-determination, we do the things that we feel and think. We do what we feel and think. It's like, that's it. That's, that is, that's freedom, right, to the world. It's not biblical freedom. When God is our master, we do what he feels and thinks. You, you get this. Just put the words up there, right? Just rest on that for a little bit. Old life. Resurrected new life. This is such a contrast from God's perspective. This is such a contrast from Paul's perspective. Is it a contrast to us? Because I, I, I blur those. You guys, you guys with me? We, we, don't we do this? We, we, we blur them. We're like, yeah, I feel like this. God's probably cool with it. Or I think this way. And, I, and, we, and we just kind of... But if we're... If we're really sons and daughters, if we're really slaves to righteousness, that bottom line, man, we would be on our knees way more than we are going, God, what do you want? What should I do? How should I respond? How do I act? What should I say? How do you want me to be thinking about this? Shouldn't we? Because it's that, it's when, we're, it's when we're pouring over scripture, when we're reading the truths, that, where we read the actual words of our creator, that we're like, yeah, I want those words to be my words too. Like, I want your feelings to be my feelings, God. I want, I want to think the way that you're thinking about this relationship I have. I want to think the way that you're thinking about my life and the decisions I'm making. I want to. God, help me. Verse 21 says, But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. In this fake freedom, Paul's making this argument, right? He's, he's been going back and forth between the old life and the new life. And he's proving that, that we want the new life. He's proving this, right? He's, he's proving that the new life should be so fundamentally different and he's proving it based on their own anecdotal evidence. He goes, go back. Think about what your life was. He goes, you're ashamed of those things. What fruit were you getting? Like, what was, what was just coming out of your life? Shame, regret, self-pity, self-absorption, selfishness, envy, jealousy, discontentment. Right? Like the list goes on and on and on. And, and he's going like, this is the fruit that you got. When you were pursuing your own heart's desires, right? Idolatry leads to what? Immorality, right? So when you're pursuing your own heart's desires, it gets bad. It gets bad quick. And he goes, and, and, and now you're, you're here. You're, you're in this new resurrected life with Christ. And you've, got this, you're, you've now been reconciled to God. He's like, and if you remember last week in, in Romans 6, 1, he goes, you know, like, what's our relationship with sin now? He's like, you look back at that and you should go, oh, my gosh, I don't want anything to do with that. He's like, look at the fruit that it produced. You know it was a fake freedom. You know it wasn't real freedom. And then he goes on. Then he makes this huge contrast in verse 22. He says, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, we're going to get to the second part of that. Just pause. So you go. He goes, you've been set free from this slavery to what? To be slaves of God. That's real freedom. I know. This is, this is, this is the hard part of the sermon. <laughs> 
How in the world can that be freedom? Look at verse 17. Back up. Paul says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. You see that? Your obedience is not, is not slavery in the sense that you're doing things that you're being forced to do these things. That's not, and this is where Paul goes, I'm, I'm losing words here. I can't communicate this well. He goes, you're, you're obeying from the heart. Like you want to do these things. This is why we say that God changes our hearts. He, he changes the inclinations of our heart. We are, we're either inclined to lawlessness and rebellion in our own hearts and selfishness, or we're inclined to God and, and righteousness and to, and to wish and, and long for the days that we will be in his presence and we will be fully clean and sin will be no more and we will be fully and completely reconciled. Like That's what we long for and we go, God, I just want to know what your will is and I want to do your will. That's what he says, is being enslaved to God. I want to do your will, God. Doesn't mean that we're going to do it. Do we want to do it? Is that our pursuit? Are we trying? Is that, is that the longing of our hearts? Because that's the, that's the change. That's the difference that he's pointing to here. You see, we get into this mindset, this whole... American freedom, not even just American, right? But like, like this whole pursuit of freedom. I mean, it's, 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 it pervades everything that we think about. And, we, and it's this idea that we can just do whatever we want. And, but we can't. We ought not to. We, we want to be slaves to God. We want to be slaves to righteousness. We want our inclinations to be towards God. And yet, we find ourselves falling into this trap. We dwell on our own circumstances, and we're, and we're just we're, we're mulling about and just marinating in just our depravity and our problems and our circumstances. And God's like, I, I have stuff for you to do. You can sit in the corner and wallow, or you can start serving. You can, you can sit there and... and and cry about your circumstances, or you can go and build my kingdom and, and enjoy the joy, peace, and contentment that I have in that. He's like, you have no right. You have no right to disobey. You have no rights to live the life that you want to live. I get it. That's not, that flies in the face of everything that we think of, doesn't it? If God really created us, we are creatures designed by God for God. Right? Does the clay have the right to say to the potter, why did you make me? Like, here we are. And as God created us, and he loves us, and he lavishes his grace, and he, and he dies for us. And we go, awesome. I'm busy this afternoon. Martin Lloyd Jones, I'll share this sermon because I could not do it justice. And, and it was, I was like in the airport, like crying. <laughs> I'm like, this is so good. He goes, I mean, it, he walks through this and he's got a, a British accent, so that makes everything kind of cooler. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Instant authority <laughs> on nature or the Bible. <laughs> oh, sorry. And, he, and he's like, you have no right to live the life that you want to live. Why, why do we think that we have this right? He's like, you have no right to sin. You have no right. You are slaves to God. Maybe we need to just wrestle with that a little bit more. Like, we like the sons and daughters thing. Super cool. Makes us feel all warm and cozy inside. And, it's, and there's a truth to it. So I'm not, not dis, I'm not discarding that. But maybe we need to spend a little bit more time focusing on what this new life looks like in obedience and slaves to God and slaves to righteousness. And going, God, I want to do your will. I want to pursue righteousness in my life. 
And this is how Jesus lived, right? Jesus says, not my will, but your will. Now he says, take this cup from me, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is like, I don't, I don't want to go this way, but not my will, your will. See, that's not how we interpret our lives. It's our will, and we just need to make sure that God's okay with it. Can you just stamp this real quick, God? I gotta, I gotta move on. Okay, so just as Paul goes, that was fake freedom, and, and here's the fruit of fake freedom. Now he's gonna go, let me show you that this is the real way. Like this slavery to God is a good thing, and it's gonna produce fruit. And you're gonna enjoy it, right? So so Paul's doing a little bit of a sales pitch here, going, like, this isn't just but just trust me in this. He goes, let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at the second part of verse 22. He says, the fruit you get leads to sanctification. And its end, eternal life. If you've got your Bibles open or you've got it on your phone or whatever, I want you to underline that word, you get. It does not say the fruit you produce. You get it. So who's the giver? Who's the giver? And who's the receiver? We are. This is important. So you go down this theological rabbit trail on this one. This is fundamentally important. The fruit you get. So what's the fruit of real freedom? We, we, we get this fruit in our lives, and this fruit looks good, righteousness. It's not us producing it. It's being produced in us, through us. Turn back over to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus talks about just this. When he's describing the fruit, he says, so every healthy, oh, sorry, I don't know if I said it. Matthew 7, verse 17. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. One last verse, it's not on the screens because I just added it. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. If this great exchange has happened, if you have received Christ's righteousness and Jesus has taken your sins, if you're saved, right? If you've, if you've placed your trust in Christ, you will bear good fruit. You will. That's it. It's not like, it's not a question. Paul's not trying to woo us and inspire us into producing good fruit. We receive it. Right? If you are converted, if you, your heart has been changed by God, you will produce good fruit. And then on the other side, if you're not producing good fruit, if you're producing bad fruit, question needs to be asked, did this happen? Do you really trust Christ? Just hang on that. Because it's not just words that we say. You, you might have professed, right? You might have said, yeah, no, I totally believe that Jesus rose from the grave, right? Like there, there may be some intellectual knowledge there. You may, you may understand it. You may grasp it. You may, you may grasp a lot of the Bible. But if you don't trust Christ, you will not produce fruit in your life. So what does this fruit look like? Turn over to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Okay, I'm just going to pause there for a second. We're going to go through this for a bit, but they're opposed to each other. Obedience to God or obedience to self. Okay, you guys with me here? He's like, you can, you can obey God or you can obey the flesh. You can obey God or you can obey your heart. You can follow God or you can follow your own devices. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Man, if there isn't like a real, just really plain, like, this isn't like theological language. He's like, listen, God gave you his Holy Spirit so that you won't do the things that you want to do. <laughs> Does that not describe our, our, our sinful nature? Does that not, I mean, just in that wording right there, it's like, the world's theology, the world's philosophy of life comes tumbling down because this is real. Listen, there's a lot of things that I want to do that I don't do. That's okay. God says that's okay. He's like, that's why I gave you your spirit, the, the Holy Spirit. The, oh, by the way, that's why I'm the one producing the fruit in you. You just sit tight and just start living as slaves to God. It says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. This is what Paul's pointing to. He's like, that's the old life. These are the things that your heart desired, and then these are the, this is the fruit that comes out of those, that life. And, and we still see remnants of these things. And, and Paul's going to walk through this in chapter 7 and 8, and we're going we're to walk through like, what this adopted life looks like, what it looks like to be a child of God. And he's going to walk through these things. Because the reality is, is we still struggle with these, don't we? Like they're there. I had a fit of anger last night. <laughs> Computer wasn't working. You know what I mean? It's just dumb stuff like that, right? It's shameful. And you're like, yeah, really? I'm trying to put in slides for today. This slide probably was frustrating to me, right? I probably was angry at this slide. How ironic is that? Right? And God's like, this is so cute. But drunkenness and envy and divisions, right? Like these things are pervasive and they're all over. But it's not a place for us to settle. We don't just sit there and go, oh, well, it's okay. Everybody does it. That's not the point. That's not what God's trying to say here. He says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is not a shot across the bow, okay? What he's saying is the people who are part of the old life, right, who are, who are following their own heart's desires, who are living in rebellion to God, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not have eternal life. They will have eternal death. That's what he's saying here. He's not saying, like, well, Jonathan, that, that slide, remember, when you were trying to build that thing? That was it. You're out. Eternity was at stake. Should have had better Wi-Fi. You know, like... <laughs> Right? So, so we, can't, we, we don't want to go down this like legalistic road to this. It's not that. It's the contrast between the old life and the new life. And then he goes on. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit belongs to who? The Spirit. Is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he says, against such things, there's no law, right? And what he's saying is, like, nobody outlaws those things. Nobody doesn't like those things. Everybody likes those things. There isn't, there isn't a single thing on that list that you're like, yeah, I could go without that one. Right? We would all take all of those things. We're like, yes. The question is, is where do you think you get those things? Do you get them in the old life? Do you think following your own will and your own heart, your deceitful heart, is going to produce those things? Or do you feel like, Following God and being a slave to God is going to produce those things. That's the difference. 
That's the question. That's the question the whole world asks. How do I have love and gentleness and patience and kindness, gentleness and self-control? The question is, is how? Slaves to rebellion or slaves to God? And he says in verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Their old life. You see how all these things are connected? Right? We spent all this time on, on Easter and leading up to Easter of this, like, this death, right? Like we were united to Christ and so we died with him and he rose and so we rose and then we got this new life. And Paul's going, like, this is the new life. This is what it should look like. And what he says in Romans 6.22 is that this life produces fruit. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Do the branches produce fruit on their own? No. They produce fruit because they're connected to the vine. And he goes on to say, abide in me, stay close to me, draw close to me, pursue righteousness, be with me, and, and you will produce fruit in your life. You will see these things in your life in increasing measure throughout your life. And that's called sanctification. Turn over real quick to 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That's a really good verse, you guys. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of good verses in the Bible. Maybe I'll, yeah, I think I have to say all of them are. But that's a really good one. Because it, it, it tells us what to expect in our lives and what we ought to do. Behold. Behold the glory of the Lord. Spend time in his word. Spend time in his presence. Behold him. Look upon him. And what will happen? We will be changed. We will be transformed. To what? To the image of God that we had in Genesis 1 in the garden before the fall. Right? Like that, that's the goal. Like, like God is, is taking jacked up us, Right? And he's changing us. He changed us, right? That's, that's called definitive sanctification, okay? Kind of theological term, right? But it happened. It's a point in time in the past, that whole great exchange between Christ and us, that happened. We are sanctified. We are holy. We are set apart for God's purposes. Done. It's done. Progressive sanctification is this. We are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. Every day, producing fruit. Why? For what purpose? Hebrews 12, 14. I know I didn't put that one in there. Okay. Maybe I did. Okay. Is it up there? Do I have it? No, I have a big thumbs down for my wife. Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Let me just read that again. Strive for peace with people that you get along with, that agree with you. No, that's not what it says. We are to be peacemakers. We are to strive for for peace with everyone and for the holiness, righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit being set apart. That's what holiness means. I've said that, I, I'm going to say this every time I say holiness because in our minds, we get this like holy roller, like, you know, do what I say, not what I do, whole kind of thing. That's not what it is. It's, it's set apart, like for God's purposes. That's what that means. So pursue having peace with everyone and pursue being set apart for God's purposes. Do that. Because if you don't, no one will see the Lord. It's not for you. It's 
it's not for you. You see, like this is the, this is the, we, we, we take beautiful, amazing things and we just ship them into selfishness. Like so quick, like we're like, oh, fruit of the Spirit. I would love some love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. That would be, make my life so much easier. People would like me. I'd be way more successful. God's like, you're, you take everything and just put it in your pocket. He's like, that's not what it's for. It's, it's so that people would see the fruit of the Holy Spirit and see God and know God. So you're not like saying like, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty dope. Like that's not the point. It's that we're pointing back to Christ. And we're going like, no, it's him. It's him that's done this. And you go back through and you can tell them all about justification and sanctification, right? But like you, you point to Christ and you're like, this is why God is sanctifying us. He doesn't need you to be a better you. You're not earning your salvation. You have your salvation. Now you're for God's purposes in this world. Every day, every hour, what do I do? How do I interpret this circumstance? How do I deal with this? How do I react to this person? How, what do I talk about? What do I think about? What am I spending my time and my resources and my energy on? All of that. He goes, be about my purposes. What am I going to do in my future? What's my next job? Who does he want me to marry? What, uh, you know what I mean? Like all of those questions, we go, I don't want what my heart and mind wants. I want what God wants. Romans 6, 23. Very, very famous verse here. For the wages of sin is death. I'm sorry. I'm not going to go to that yet. I've got one more thing to say <laughs> in the previous verse. It says, it, um, sorry, in verse 22, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end, eternal life. This is, this is really important, and I, I kind of alluded to it a little bit. Paul is not saying your fruit leads to eternal life. He's saying your fruit leads to sanctification, increased holiness, Increase righteousness, right? You produce fruit more and more and more. And the end of that train, that path, is eternal life. When we are in the presence of God, we will be perfectly holy. Here, we will never be. And so what he's pointing to here is that this path is the path that leads, right? Like when, when Christ comes back, we're going to be changed in an instant. We're going to be transformed, right? We're going to be in the presence of God, perfectly holy, no sin, complete righteousness, our hearts and minds and thoughts aligned with God's. That's the end state. It's not like you might get there. You have been justified. You have been sanctified. Now this process is what? To reveal God to the world. And the end of this, you will be in heaven with Christ, holy, fully and completely sanctified. It's important because the other path where you go, well, this fruit produces eternal life. And so if I don't produce this fruit, I might not get this eternal life. Not true. Not true. The fruit is from who? From God. So you have to well up in yourself all this fruit and just make sure that you're doing the right things and make sure you do more good things than bad things and, and you're working for it by no means because this is what he says in verse 23. Now we're on verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. The wages. You work for it, here's your wages. Right? You get paid wages for the things that you work for. And so, those who are working and are, and are striving, he says, the wages of sin is death. But in contrast to that, the free gift of God is eternal life. He does not say, if you, it, the wages of sin is death, and the wages of producing fruit in your life is eternal life. He does not say that. That's what he would say, right? 
if this was our effort. This is what's amazing about the gospel. This is why it's good news. We work, we got nothing. We got no gain. He gives us a gift and we receive it. We have eternal life. That's the contrast Paul makes here. Spend your time on 623 because he is, very, he is summarizing all that he said in, in chapter 6. Slaves to unrighteousness, slaves to righteousness, slaves to lawlessness and disobedience, slaves to obedience, slaves to our own hearts, slaves to God. And at the end he goes, wages of sin is death, free gift. We got to rest on that. Because if you guys walk out of here going, man, I got to really make sure I'm obeying. We've missed it. It's not the point. It's not what he's saying. You will produce fruit in increasing measure. That doesn't mean you sit on your butts and just wait. Okay? I don't know if I can say that, but I just did. So it is what it is. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that we sit back in this lackadaisical attitude going like, well, I guess, you know, if God wants me to be a better person, then I'll just make me a better person. That's not it. You are pursuing something in your life. You're pursuing a lot of things in your life. We all are. The question is, is are you pursuing righteousness? Or are you pursuing your own desires? Let me pray. God, you know how tough it is for us. I just, I just love the way that you speak to us and the way that you, uh, you're just so gracious to us. I know that this is not the rescue plan that I would have devised, but it is the one that you did. And we are in awe of you for that. God, I pray that you would help us. Help us to be about your business. Help us to pursue righteousness. Not because we're trying to earn your favor, but because we know that the end of it is joy and peace and contentment. Like That's the path. That's real freedom. We want to be free in you, Father. And so we humbly come under your authority in our lives and ask you to transform our hearts, change our way of thinking, align it all to be with you. You are such a good God. We need you desperately, Father. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for rescuing us. We pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to take some time now to just respond to God. So this is, this is your time. You can just hang out in your seat and, and pray to God. And, and I would encourage you, I would encourage you right now to think through what you're pursuing in your life. And please hear me right in this. This doesn't mean you you got to be a missionary. It doesn't mean, right, there, there aren't like two options of serving God, right? Like, your pursuits probably, probably can be aligned with God's will. You probably, you, you probably need to let go a little bit. You probably need to do a little trusting. Your pursuits might not be. It might be clearly rebellion. Spend this time seeking God's wisdom in your life. Ask him. He wants you to know, right? Clearly, his plan is for you to know. So it's not like he's playing I have a secret. He's not trying to hide this from you. Behold him. Behold him and watch yourself be transformed. That's his promise. That's a beautiful promise, you guys. And there's, and there's nobody in here that's, that's done. Nobody. Like, this is, this is for all of us. And so spend this time. Reflect. Think through it. 
Um, if you want to pray with somebody, the prayer team will be at the doors. If you're like, I, I don't know, please come. Come and talk to people. This is why God has us gather as a church, is so that we can bounce things off of each other. It's a beautiful thing to go, man, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? What do you think? It's a good thing. Do you think this is pursuing? Is this my, is this my heart that's, that's making me do this? You know, right? Because we're, we're good at rationalizing our decisions, aren't we? So don't do it in a vacuum. So you can come and pray with us. You can fill out. We've got the green cards over there. You can fill, them out, fill one out with a prayer request. You can put your name on it or not and drop it in the offering box back there. Like, we would love to be praying for you throughout the week. But let me encourage you to do this. If you've been baptized, if you placed your trust in Christ, please come and take communion. This is where we, we reflect on who Christ is and what he did and how he enabled all of this. Because without Christ's righteousness, without him taking our sins. There, there is no Holy Spirit that's dwelling inside of us. There's no Holy Spirit producing fruit. Our lives are just horrible and filled with rebellion. But it's through Christ that we have hope. And so you can come, there, there's bread, and you can dip it in the juice and come back to your seat, or you can pray with somebody else or take it with somebody else. But let's, let's reflect on Christ and celebrate him and what he's done. Let's, let's respond together.